All right, it looks like we've come to a little bit of a slowdown of people jumping in. So hi, everybody. Just wanted to say hello. Welcome to our next wine club tasting, our virtual tasting. This week, we are focusing on our Bordeaux Lovers Club wines that we just sent out. So I hope that some of you have some of these wines so you can enjoy along with us. I am Sarah Rathbun, the Director of Marketing and Communications here for Dry Creek Vineyard. And I'm joined with our winemaker, Tim Bell, who's going to be telling you lots of amazing things about the wines that he made for you and that you get to enjoy. Um, just a few quick little housekeeping things. We're going to keep everybody on mute for the time being, but we do have a function down below the chat function, and we also have the Q&A function. Um, so you can get a hold of us either way with your questions, and we can answer them to the best of our abilities here. So go ahead and definitely utilize the function. Um, the Q&A function is really the most helpful. So if you can can use that Q&A function, that'll, that'll keep us on target. So without further ado, I just want to welcome you all again, and I will hand it over to our winemaker, Tim Bell here. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you, Sarah. And um, I'm here with my COVID hair. It's longer than it's ever been. Uh, <laughs> or I should say, I, I've gone longer without a haircut than I ever have, but I'm feeling a little desperate. I might have my daughter try her hand at, at cutting my hair, but we'll see. She's the artist in the family, so what could go wrong? Um, I'm, I'm really happy and excited to be with you again today and um, looking forward to hearing some of your questions or input, comments. Um, certainly welcome that, as Sarah said, to the, using the chat and uh, make it a at least somewhat interactive experience. Um, and um, yeah, I want to know what you what you want to know. Um, before you know, kind of go into um, our lineup of wines today, I thought I would just talk a bit about what's going on right now in the winery and in the vineyards. And uh, we, we've been in a, a place where like early in April, we had some rain, got a little shot of rain. And then now we've had some warm weather. In fact, the last couple of days have been unusually warm and the vines are loving it. I, I'm spending a lot of time walking around in the vineyards around the winery, kind of making myself get out because it's more acutely aware that I can't always go get out wherever I want to. So I'm taking this opportunity here at work. And um, it's just amazing how, how fast the, the vines are growing. Um, some of the, the Wallace Ranch Zinfandel, uh, I saw some shoots today that are, you know, anywhere from two to two and a half feet long. So, I mean, they've almost reached full length, although all the leaves aren't fully grown out yet and the bunches are just really sizing up. Um, we are, haven't gotten to uh, set yet, so that's where the little grape flowers open up and you know fertilize and become grapes, but we're, we'll, we'll be there soon. Uh, you know, usually somewhere in May is where we hit that point. Um, but aside from that, it's just, you know, you know we're all sort of in, in lockdown or, or shelter in place, I guess we, we call it, but the vines and, and the, all the wild, wildlife out there has no idea. Um, so they are just, uh, <laughs> thank you, Michael Longerbeam, for that comment. I just saw that. Um, <laughs> um, what was I saying? So, you know, they're, they're busy living and there's a lot of life force going on out there. And the, the flowers in uh, the vineyard and right in front of the winery, DCV2, planted in the rows between the vines is just crazy right now. There's lots of poppies and lots of clover. Um, it's just really exploding. We, we, we used a kind of a special flower mix for the cover crop on the DCV2 vineyard this year. But even in uh, DCV7, where we um, planted some beans before for uh, putting nitrogen in the soil, there's a lot of clover everywhere that's just really beautiful. So um, if you have a chance, um, come see us and enjoy this beauty because it's really great. You know, in, in terms of what's going on in the winery, so we are uh, bottling 2019 Chenin Blanc. Um, it's been really exciting. This is a, this vintage, 2019 vintage of Shannon is kind of unusually exotic. In fact, I, I sent a text off to um, our grower, uh, David Ogilvie. He's part of the Wilson family uh, where we get our um, Chenin Blanc and we've, we've dealt with them for many years. And I just said, hey, did you slip some Gewürztraminer or something else in there this year? And he said, no, but do you need some? Um, he's, he's always a good salesman. So um, I said, I'll let you know. But uh, yeah, it's a really great wine. When I just, when I, when I put my head in the top of the tank each day and I'm checking on, you know, how fast we're going and making sure we're, you know, we've got some good nitrogen gas going in the tank so we don't get oxygen pickup. 
um, the aromas coming out of the tank are just amazing. And then we are also in the midst of just finishing up our Fumé Blanc blend. Um, literally today, I think we're, we're finishing that, that final step of blending. And so that's um, an exciting thing that'll be coming up too. And we've got some new little tweaks on the label that are coming up. So um, it's kind of got a new look coming. So we're excited about that as well. So yeah, that's, that's what's going on right now. And um, last, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we did a, one of these with where we focused on four different uh, Zinfandel wines. And now we've got uh, Bordeaux style varieties as well. And, you know, one thing people always think of Dry Creek Valley as um, Zinfandel first, right? But, you know, in terms of, of how much grapes are grown here, Cabernet is usually always neck and neck with Zinfandel each year. Um, you know, one given year, there actually might be more Cabernet grown in Dry Creek Valley and another year, uh, maybe more Zinfandel. So I know for you, Dry Creek Valley is not an undiscovered gem or secret for Bordeaux Reds, but for many people it is. And we are proudly championing our area as a Bordeaux region. And we have a long history with making the Bordeaux Reds as well. So, um, I think with that, maybe we'll head to our first wine. Does that sound good, Sarah? Or do we have some questions that we need to talk, talk through already? No, oh, that sounds good. Let's get into it. Great. So um, I'm gonna get my glass there. And um, I did have a chance to smell through these a little bit before we, we started. One of the uh, benefits of my job. And uh, I, I just really get, like this wonderful sort of almost like cherry pie with a little bit of you know spices that go along with that out of this wine. Um, we have a, a good long history with Merlot. Um, I actually just learned um, earlier today our first vintage of, Mer of Merlot as a variety was in 1974 and it was a very small bottling. I was really you know David Stair put a lot of this cool information on the labels back then um, and it was like 256 bottles, I think. So um, it was, it was, you know, you, you count that up in cases, it's like 21 cases plus a few extra bottles. And, he, and it literally, he said it was one barrel that they held back in bottle. So extremely small lot wine making um, from the beginning, and we're still doing it. Um, there's the label right there. And um, I don't know offhand what the blend is, but you can just about count on the fact that it was a blend because we've you know, very much been in the Bordeaux tradition for years and years of not um, blend, you know, bottling 100% of a single variety typically, um, although we have one exception today in our lineup, but typically we, we like to follow that Bordeaux tradition. And I, I've, you know, in all my winemaking history, making Bordeaux reds, I uh, really love to do that as well. So this Merlot is, is primarily Merlot, 76% Merlot, but we've got 9% Cabernet Franc, 8% um, Cabernet Sauvignon. There is 5% Malbec and 2% Petit Verdot. So we've hit all the five major Bordeaux reds in this blend. And you know that really gives us, me as a winemaker, an opportunity to fill in some spaces in the mouthfeel or the, you know, the, the texture, maybe build in some structure, like you know, Cabernet and Petit Verdot have more tannin. So they may, um, you know, give us a little more, um, you know, body and just ability to age. And something like Malbec can often sort of fill in the mid palate. It's a very sort of plump, feeling, textured wine. And uh, you know, Merlot itself is um, is really wonderful. And we all know it's had an up and down history in California. Um, when you're out in the vineyard, um, you know, one of the things that I have to really look for. In, in Merlot is uh, the, the bunches tend to want to sort of lay on top of each other. They kind of have these sort of floppy stems and they kind of just sort of all lay on top of each other. So you have to uh, really pay some attention um, in the vineyard to doing some good crop thinning. And, and this photo that Sarah just put up is a good example of that. You can see that you, it's sort of hard to tell where one bunch ends and another begins. And that's just very typical of Merlot. And so um, you can't eliminate that completely without sort of going to an extreme, but you, you know, where some of these grapes are kind of laying on top of each other, you might um, have to go in there and do a little bit of judicious trimming, you know, pull out part of a cluster or sometimes even a whole cluster so that uh, 
you, you know, you get some, some space. And really what we want to do is get some good light into the fruit. So getting that light into the fruit is uh, really a key um, to getting good color development, good um, tannin development, and really just good overall flavor. Um, it, it diminishes some of the more um, green or herbaceous characteristics and brings out the fruit a little more. And I don't ever want to get totally rid of those herbaceous qualities. Um, you can you know, totally hang the fruit out there for way too long and have it sort of be um, in, un, indistinguishable from any other red wine. But um, just the right touch or right balance of that really tells you that it's Merlot or Cab or one of the Bordeaux reds typically. So um, this is a, a pretty small bottling. It was under 300 cases and there's uh, several key vineyards. So um, if you noticed on that uh, photo of our 1974 Merlot label that uh, Sarah put up a moment ago, it mentioned Jasper Long as the grower for that wine. And Jasper's son, Rick, is still growing Merlot and we're still buying fruit from, from that same vineyard. So um, you can do the math. I'm, I'm busy talking. I, I'm not gonna count on my fingers, but it's quite a long time. We've, we've had this relationship and that's very typical for Dry Creek Vineyard that we have these long-term relationships with outside growers and that helps us maintain consistency and really know the vineyard inside and out. So um, Rick is constantly out there um, tending the vines. He's really a hands-on vineyard owner. He certainly does have some help from some other folks, but um, he likes to be out there and con you know, controlling the irrigation. And, and um, you know, his, his vineyard, he, he's kind of unusual. He has a couple of walnut trees right smack in the middle of, of a couple of the blocks of Merlot. And he just likes the walnuts. And, you know, it's not, um, if you were totally into production for your vineyards, you wouldn't leave those trees there because they might compete with some of the vines immediately around them. But I love that extra little bit of character that some of these vineyards have where somebody um, you know, lives there and works the property and um, appreciates something else that's there and, and leaves it, even though it creates, it makes it harder work for them, basically. Um, one of the other really cool and interesting parts about this vineyard is it has this really old house at the front of the property and um, the bottom story is made out of adobe brick. Um, and then they've built on top of it with a wood structure, like a second story. And I've never been inside to see it, but it's just always fascinates me that this is um, an adobe structure that's still being inhabited and used today. It's, it's um, one of the cool things. Um, so that, so the, about half of this Merlot, just a little over half of it is from, from the long vineyard. And then the rest of the Merlot is from a newer vineyard for us called Sapphire Canyon. This is a vineyard that I, I found with the help of a grape broker in 2013. And it's um, just across from where Pedroncelli Winery is. And up in the hills, there are some very steep slopes. And it's, it's uh, when I tell, take people with me, you know, interns during harvest to, to har harvest that vineyard, I say, okay, you know, be ready. You're gonna get your workout today because you have to really climb that mountain and uh, you'll, be, you'll be huffing and puffing a little bit. And it's, it's all these terraced slopes and there's, they're, they're all going in all different directions. And um, the vineyard is, is very well cared for um, and just really looks great and has made some great Merlot. So it's, it's the other important component of this blend and um, really a stunningly beautiful property too. That's, that's one of the real joys for me as a winemaker that I get to go outside in some of these incredible properties and just really enjoy nature. And, and you know, there's lots of tall trees everywhere and there's a lot of little nooks and crannies. And you know, if I had more time, I would just go take a hike. Um, it's, it's a beautiful spot. Hey and Tim, then, um, Jim had a question that popped up and I thought this might be a good time to address it. It's he's asking what input do we have into what the growers are doing? Or do we have any input into what the growers are doing on their property? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely um, a collaborative relationship. Um, <clears throat> I, I know that I am not a um, viticulturalist, even though I know um, some things and I took those course, some of those courses in college um, and continue to try to educate myself about those things. But I, I know that somebody who's spending more time um, walking that land and, and working with it on a daily basis um, has a really good you know, feel for the pulse of, of, of the, the vineyard. And so I have to respect their knowledge. But I also have 
experience um, over my 20 plus years of, of winemaking of knowing what, you know, from my past experience, what good vineyards look like. Um, so and by that, I mean, in terms of what, how much crop is in the vineyard. And, you know, that can vary from site to site. Um, how much any particular vineyard can, you know, what kind of a crop load it can carry and ripen successfully. Uh, it also factors into how much light is getting into the vines. You don't want too much on the fruit. We don't want to sunburn the fruit, right? But, but we also want enough that it really brings out the color and, and the tans that we're talking about. So that might require, you know, removing some shoots here and there, um, you know, removing some leaves, so leaf thinning, and then also some cluster thinning here and there, though, like we were talking about. And so I will, you know, talk to the, the vineyard, uh, grow, the growers that we, we work with um, every year, and in each year can be a little different, but I'll say, hey, you know, this is what I'm seeing. Um, can you get in there and you know, thin some of the, the clusters, like in the Merlot? I'm every year with with Rick Long. I'm I'm at, I'm talking about that, saying, hey, you know, this particular block or this section, I think you might need to pay some attention to that. Um, and and speaking of Long, so one thing that that um, I was noticing in that vineyard that some of the vines are are pretty. Um, old and so as as vines get older sometimes the uh the spurs or the training of the vine you know starts to sort of outgrow the trellis a little bit and so we were getting a lot of shoots um flopping over and shading out some of the the fruit so you know we met out there in the vineyard and talked about what can we do to make this better um and so we we, we they were able to um, extend the trellis a little bit and um you know try some new sort of hedging and, and shoot thinning methods to get more light into the fruit. And it's really made an, uh, an important difference and um, the fruit's better. And that was a collaborative effort. And so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm out there saying what I, I think needs to be done, but I always ask, what do you think? Or how can we accomplish this goal? So that um, hopefully it's not too painful for either one of us. I hope that answered the question. It was kind of a long-winded answer, wasn't That's it? That's all right. Let's get into tasting, though. I'm sure these people are thirsty. Yeah. So let's give this a taste. So this has very, to me, very sort of velvety, um, I wouldn't say soft, but velvety texture and um, fairly minimal tannins if they don't really stand out so this wine's had a little time in the bottle and um, of course you probably know merlot is one of the softer grape varieties in the bordeaux family so it typically does it's it's kind of in terms of color and just concentration cabernet franc can be the lightest and then merlot is close nearby and sort of you sort of progress and then you know cabernet sauvignon um, Petit Verdot, Malbec typically have a lot more color. And in the case of Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot, a fair bit of tannic structure as well. It's one of the reasons why we use these different grapes to, to balance out, you know, different the color and the weight and the tannin. So it's not out of balance. And um, I feel like we certainly accomplished that here. This, these wines are all 2017 vintage. So that was a year where um, we had some cool weather early on, and then um, the end of August, and I think the first two days of September, we had this, like a five-day heat wave, and it really kicked the harvesting gear. We were already rolling, but it was kind of sort of trickling in, and then that, that really kicked it off. And so, um, you know, it wasn't too long after that that we started to bring in the Merlot, so probably within, you know, 10 days of, of that heat wave. And, um, you know, fortunately, if, if it cools off a little bit, you're not just getting, you know, a high sugar spike, but you're getting some real ripening and flavors and tannins in the wines. And um, this is, this wine has really come together in a, in a delicious way. Um, and just, just real quick to, to mention too, um, so the Malbec and Cab Franc came from our DCV6 vineyard, which is right across, I can, I can almost look out the window and see it from here. And the Petit Verdot came from our Endeavor vineyard. Um, so that's some really beautiful Petit Verdot as well. And we'll be trying that later too. Um, 
you know, we, we typically for these Bordeaux reds um, at the low end, I'm, I'm thinking about new oak treatment now. So typically around, you know, 30% maybe at the low end of new oak. And um, if it's a really big, rich wine, then we might get up to 45, 50, even 70% new oak. Uh, the Endeavor Cab, which is one of the biggest wines we make, typically has uh, you know 60 to 70 percent new oak. So it kind of all depends on the the richness and structure of the wine and what it can handle. And you know, we do, we do, we want it to be an accent, you know, a a, a, a a subtle flavor or a spice, but not to dominate the wine. And so in this this particular wine, it's 31 percent new oak, and um, we've used some Hungarian and American barrels. And uh, it's, they're really well integrated. They don't stand out. If you get a nice little subtle spice and with the beautiful fruit in this wine, um, you can credit some of that to the barrels, some of that to the grapes. And um, yeah, it's, it's that mix that really brings it all together. Um, one thing I was gonna mention too, is that, um, <laughs> so just before this, we were, Sarah and I were talking about um, uh, people are saying about these virtual tastings, don't talk bricks or TEA and pH. Well, I'm going to break the rule um, because the pH and TEA on this wine are just like almost textbook. Um, it's like 6.5 grams per liter TEA. And so I'm just going to tell you, for me as a winemaker, for a red, that's like very ideal. And a 3.57 pH. So anything about, you know, 3.65 um, or below typically will age very well. Sometimes our wines will have a higher pH than that, but Usually we're, we're you know, doing pretty good. And so I really feel like this is a wine, I'm telling you all that because I feel like it's set up with the acidity and pH to really age nicely. So um, if you have the opportunity to enjoy some now while it's very delicious and giving you that youthful fruit, by all means do so because it's really good. But if you can lay aside a few bottles to break open, you know, maybe in two years, four years, maybe you take it out to 10 years, um, for your, your last one, 10 or 12 years um, from now. Um, I think you'd, you'd really enjoy how this wine evolves over the years. Yeah. Perfect. Well, and I know we need to get moving on to the next wine, but there is a question of quickly, um, oh, there's actually two good questions. One is, what is TA? And then the other one is, um, why do you incorporate more varietals than just Merlot in the Merlot? So if you could hit those quickly before we move on to the next one, we'll be good. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm, I'm lapsing into winemaker jar, jargon when I say TA. So it's titratable acidity or total acid, you might think of it. It's basically just a measure of acidity. And, um, you know, there's, there's natural grapes, I mean, natural acids that occur in grapes. So uh, tartaric acid is the most prominent one. There's malic acid, citric acid, and a few other more minor ones. Uh, so we, we're always looking at that as an indicator um, you know, we'll watch that as we're starting in the vineyard as the grapes start to ripen. You know, it's, it's one indication of ripening happening when the acids actually start to drop. So the other question was about blending other varieties besides Merlot. So um, it certainly is possible to do 100% Merlot blend. Um, and, you know, you might have Merlot from different picks or different um, vineyards. Um, that help you give you some tools to, to sort of flesh out a blend. Um, you might even do a single vineyard bottling, but uh, I, I really, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, we really like to follow the Bordeaux model of, of typically not using just one grape variety. And uh, that's part of the reason we were behind, you know, being part of forming the Meritage Alliance um, way back in the mid eighties. So that kind of brought some recognition to um, the, the art of blending, which is a tradition in Bordeaux. So, I, you know, I will say there's some tradition there that influences us doing that. But I think, you know, if I tasted just the Merlot by itself that was in this, went into this wine, and then I tasted it with, you know, the different varieties that we've added in, I really like the blend. It just makes a more complete, a um, little bit richer wine, but it still expresses the variety of, of Merlot. Um, if you you know, if you were lucky to have all four of these wines open next to each other, you would see that they are very distinctly different. So that's part of the fun of, of doing this as we, we get to make a lot of unique and special Bordeaux style blends. Perfect. Well, let's move on to the next wine then. 
All right, so the next one that we're gonna talk about is our Benchland Meritage. And uh, I'm gonna put up the, uh, the label here because it's got one of the cooler labels, I think, that we've come up with. And um, in fact, let's hold it here. So it kind of, I don't know if you can see, kind of shows you a little, little sections here of, of specific vineyards that this wine came from. So um, this, this is a wine that we used to call Eastern Bench for the first two vintages, but we've been, uh, we've needed to change the name. Won't go into that, the why, but we have to. So um, Benchland, and basically what we're talking about when we refer to Benchland is, um, you'll, you'll hear this you know, different places like, like in Napa Valley, they talk about the Rutherford Bench. And some people here in Dry Creek Valley will talk about the Dry Creek Bench. And it's, it's on the east side of the valley, and um, I'm going to show you a topo map here. I don't know how well this is going to translate, but I'm, I've got it. Um, so right about in here is where the winery is. And you can see some hills on the east side. And then right below those hills is a kind of an uplifted area of land. You know, sometimes that might be from years ago, some of this, this dirt and rocks sort of sloughed off the, the mountains behind it. and form this elevated, slightly rocky soil. Um, there's sort of different ways that that could happen geologically, but, and, and I'm certainly not an expert, but what, what we end up with is some soil that's elevated from the valley floor and is more well-drained, has more rocks, and that tends to be um, a good recipe for good red wines, for, for good red fruit. And so, um, kind of back up, so we've, as I mentioned, we, we've been a pioneer in meritage blending. And we're the first to use that term on a label back in, I think it was 1985. And you know, in more recent years, starting with, uh, I believe it was a 2014 or maybe 2015 vintage, uh, we started making these, what we're calling terroir blends. And this, this Benchland meritage is an example of that. So, these are meritage blends, but they're different from some of the meritage blends that we've done in the past where, you know, I really, you know, after working here in Dry Creek Valley for several years, recognized that there really were some distinct um, areas within this valley that are different. So the personality of fruit grown on the eastern side of the valley on the benchlands is different from the western side on these more steep and more rocky uh, soils over there. There, there's, there's even a you know, difference in, in the, the soil appearance and texture and formation. And then uh, where our Endeavor Vineyard is, it's kind of at the southeast of Dry Creek Appalachian. It's kind of its own unique area as well. So even though we have this valley that's a cohesive unit, there are some distinct sub areas within it. So that's why we, this, this series was born. And um, I'm gonna show you a little prop here. So, Again, don't know how well this is going to translate, but these are some vials of soil. And um, right here is the eastern bench. And this is the western slopes. So you, if hopefully you can see there's a pretty distinct color difference in these. And um, the western slopes tends to have high iron content, so it has a little more reddish hue, where the eastern bench is a little more brown. And uh, both pretty, pretty good rocky soils. And uh, the, the eastern bench is not, um, the vines tend to be a little bit more vigorous than on the western side. So we do get some beautiful richness in the fruit, but also some elegance and finesse that we might not get so much on the western, western side of the valley. So for us, the, there's, there's a few vineyards that contributed to this wine. So it's 59% it's, um, it's Cabernet and 23% Cabernet Franc, and the rest, 18% uh, is Malbec. And there's a, a couple of, of key Cabernet vineyards that are part of this. We've got um, the Walcott family's vineyard, which um, is also a family we've worked with for many, many years. Um, and then also uh, Forchini. So uh, Forchini's are um, a, a second generation um, Dry Creek Valley family as well. And um, on the Eastern bench have some beautiful land there and we get some Cabernet from them. Um, so the, the Walcott Vineyard, uh, we usually do two picks every year. There's uh, some lower, fruit, sort of lower, bigger vines that don't have as much uh, fruit hanging on them, and uh, those will those will be picked first because they ripen faster. And then there's some vines at the front of the property, uh, kind of rolling over a hill, 
and there's actually a little bit of terraces on one end of that hill. And those vines tend to be more vigorous and they can hang a bigger crop and it takes a, a little bit longer to ripen. them. So I, I looked back at the records for this one, um, the 2017, and that first Cabernet pick and the second Cabernet pick, it was um, I think close to two weeks between those. And we have some wine from both of those picks in here. So again, I have same vineyard, two different lots, different personalities within the vineyard. And then Porchini, uh, they've got this, this long block that sort of rolls up and down this, this gentle hill, hillside. And uh, it's surrounded by some really beautiful tall pine trees. And there's a, a big creek kind of that runs down one side of, of the vineyard, the back side of the vineyard. It's a seasonal creek. So um, when I get to go out there early in the year, I get to hear some beautiful babbling water. But later in the season, it it's, gets very close to drying up. But um, the Forkinis, Andrew Forkini is, has been a, a great help to me in just knowing things about vineyards. He's really a man of the soil and he gets really excited about his vineyard and, and he'll you know, get out there and he'll start digging through the dirt and saying, look, you know, there's, there's still some moisture down there in the soil. We don't need to irrigate right now. And uh, he'll talk to me about the composting or he tells me all these different things you know, he's trying to do to get the crop balanced. And uh, he really puts a lot of effort and he's got, um, a great right-hand man there too, who um, uh, Gerardo, who really knows um, how to thin fruit and pull leaves and do it just right. So beautiful vineyard. So that's the Cabernet portion. So, and then the Cabernet Franc and Malbec um, come from the DCV6 vineyard, which is across the road from the winery here. And, you know, some people might question, oh really, is that Eastern Bench? Um, I believe, I, I, I call this bench land because right where the winery sits and then across Dry Creek Road um, to the east is some elevated land that is rockier soil, produces really good red fruit. But right behind the winery and actually within the, the DCV6 vineyard itself, the slope, you know, quickly drops off, you know, drops, you know, probably 30, 40 feet or so. And actually here's a photo of, of the DCV6 vineyard. Um, this is actually kind of looking from the top. And you can't really tell, but the, the vines in the foreground um, are, I believe, would be some of the Malbec and the Cab Franc. So the Malbec would be more over on the, the left side of the photograph. And um, down below is actually some Sauvignon Blanc. And the reason we've got those three different varieties planted there is because um, up on the slope, on the bench, that's great red uh, grape territory. Down there where the Sauvignon Blanc is and you know, further out in that photograph, that's valley poor, poor soil. It's uh, more fertile soil, so it's better suited to Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc is not a variety that we typically want to do a lot of leaf pulling on. Um, we don't mind a somewhat bushy canopy, and uh, that actually you know, we actually like some of those those slightly herbaceous characters that that come be because of that and not getting a lot of light into the fruit. So it's a perfect spot for that variety. And uh, yeah, so that's that's. The, the key vineyards for this one as well. Um, I'm going to give this a taste and then I'll have a few more comments about the wine. You know, Tim, um, we had a question come up. You're talking about a lot of vineyards that we work with that aren't necessarily some of our estate vineyards. And so one of our questions was about what's the percentage of, of grapes that we own on our estate vineyards versus the ones that we have long time growing partnerships with. Yeah, so it, it's, it, it varies a little bit from year to year, um, but it's a little bit less than half is, is a state fruit. And then the rest of that has been from other growers. And, and as I mentioned, it's, it's typically long-term partnerships with growers. So um, we don't have a big revolving door of, of different growers. Um, and that's great for me as a winemaker, because like I said, I get to really know those vineyards and it almost feels like it's an estate vineyard as well, because we I'm working with the same blocks and the same grower from year to year. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to mention, so, so compared to the Merlot, even though this has a, a good amount of Cab Franc and less, um, you know, it, it's, you know, which would, you might think would make sort of a, a lighter red, it, it's a fairly big and rich red, but, but it's, it's the, the Benchland uh, blend that we make, the Meritage, typically for me is sort of a somewhat voluptuous kind of wine. So the tannins don't stand out, they're not dry. It's just very plump and, and has beautiful depth of berry fruit. Um, I always tell people that this Cabernet Franc 
that we work with from DCV6 is the, which is an statement, of course, is the best Cabernet Franc I've worked with in my entire career. And I'm not just saying it because I work here. It's the truth. I, I have to be honest, when I came here, I, I had worked with Cab Franc and I wasn't a huge fan. Um, it, I think I've, over the years I've developed this idea that I think that it's, it's very site specific. You have to have a very good site. Some other varieties might be a little more forgiving. Cabernet Sauvignon I think is a little more forgiving, although you still want a good site. But um, Cabernet Franc really needs the right site. Um, and if you don't have the right site, it just makes sort of a lighter red with some sort of pleasant cherry flavors in, the, in its youth. And as it ages, it kind of becomes sort of like um, dried chilies, um, you know, like, like chili powder almost, um, which, you know, some little element of that is great, but if you don't have the fruit and other things, qualities there with it, it's, it's not so exciting. And so when I came here and started to work with this Cabernet Franc, um, I was just blown away. It's, it's got amazing color. It's a, a, a special selection that came from the Loire Valley. Cabernet Franc is one of the, the main reds of the Loire Valley, although it's typically very light. But this was, a, this was a selection known for its depth of color, and it certainly <clears throat> has proved to be the case here at DCV6. So I think it's the combination of the right um, clone selection, you know, the right grape selection of, of Cabernet Sauvignon, and um, just the right site. And, and some really good vineyard management as well. Um, yeah, and then like I said, the Malbec really just kind of plumps out the wine. Um, this wine has 37% new oak, and um, this happens to be all French oak barrels. Um, don't necessarily subscribe to having to use one over the other, you know, French versus Hungarian or, or European or American. They all have good qualities and we use them all, but it just turns out that some of the, the barrels that I love most with the Bordeaux Reds tend to be some of the French Coopers. Um, I feel, I, I really don't necessarily feel that way for Zinfandel, for example. But, um, so this is all French oak and, and some, some really great Coopers like Demptos and Malois, some of my favorites that really, um, you know, sort of deepen and darken the fruit a little bit. I think that's one of the great benefits, especially with Bordeaux Reds. Um, and a new oak barrel can add a, a, a deeper dimension to the fruit and some nice flavors, but um, rarely, if ever, 100% because it typically overwhelms the wine. So it's a nice tool or ingredient in my, my uh, kitchen to use in, in making these wines. Great. Well, I know we need to move to the next wine, but we do have one more question about have you ever considered adding Carmenere to the Bordeaux blends? Um, I would... I, that's a good question. So I would consider doing that. It's just that, um, honestly, I don't have a lot of experience. And there's actually some other red varieties um, allowed for, for um, in Bordeaux and in, in, in the Meritage, uh, official Meritage wines from California. Um, uh, but, and I, they're, they're pretty obscure. So I, I don't have a lot of experience with those, quite honestly. And I don't know of anyone around here who's growing those as well. So Carmenere or any of those others as well. So, um, you know, if the opportunity ever comes where we plant a new vineyard of our own, and I do hope that comes someday, um, we certainly could look into doing small amounts of those just as kind of a trial. It would be really fun. Um, or if that opportunity comes up with a grower, but um, you know, we'll have to do a little more research to make sure we're, we're asking for what, something that we really want. Um, you know, in, in the, the white side of Bordeaux um, varieties, that has been one of the great fun things that we've done with our Marinus blend is we've, we've had a grower who had a small bit of land, about an acre, and he was willing to try a funky grape variety if we would commit to, to taking it. And so we did some Muscadel de Bordelais, and that's been a part of the Marinus and has really been uh, a lot of fun for me as a winemaker. But I digress. Fun. Well, let's continue on then to the Iron Slopes Cabernet. Okay. So Iron Slopes um, started its life as Western Slopes, um, and we've changed the name to Iron Slopes. And, and it's appropriate because there is a lot of iron content in those Western soils on Dry Creek Valley. It does tend to lend a very sort of rusty red color to the soil, sometimes very stunningly beautiful um, when you see that soil out in the vineyard. And uh, typically, we'll have 
uh, steeper slopes in this part of, of the valley. So Sarah's put up a photograph from Voginson Ranch, which is one of the key vineyards we have on, in, in the western hills, or the western slopes. And uh, you can see some of that really nice red soil between the vines. And um, it typically, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's rockier soil, so we don't get as high of yields there. It, it kind of restricts the growth on the vines. Um, and we get more concentrated fruit. We tend to have bigger tannin, bigger structure. So that's one of the reasons with this wine, we use a little bit of Malbec to kind of round out some of that, that those tannins. Um, and in fact, um, that sort of brings to mind that one thing you'll hear, hear, hear people talking about with wines, usually typically reds in particular, but also whites is, is fining which is when you add something to the wine to remove some component of, of the wine or the juice that is perhaps out of balance or in excess. And so, you know, the, in, in Bordeaux, sort of the time-honored thing was to maybe use some egg whites in, in the red wines. And that would, that protein in the egg whites would pull out some of the, the excess tannin in, in the, some of the, the grapes. And so I have done fining in the past, but you know, since I've come to Dry Creek Vineyard, we've done virtually no fining. And pretty much the reds, I can say from a lot of years now, we haven't done any fining at all. And um, what I like to do is try to, first of all, get the balance right in the vineyard. Um, second of all, try to get the balance right in the wine as it's fermenting. So it's one of the reasons I'm tasting all the fermenters every day. Um, when they get to the midpoint of fermentation, we really start to see the the phenolic structure, the tannins um, developing in the wine and the color as well. And so, you know, monitoring that closely and, and deciding when to press the tank, the, the juice off the skins is really a key, I think, in getting good tannin balance. And then finally, using the blend tools of blending. Um, so it's the art of blending that really can make a wine balanced. And if you can do that without having to do any fining, I love it because, you know, finding you always run the risk of pulling out something you want with something you don't. So if you're trying to remove tannin, you might lose some color as well with those egg whites or other things that you can use. Um, and so as I mentioned all that, this, this wine, I think, is, is nicely balanced. So let's give it a taste. And everyone, remember, you can use that Q&A feature if you have a question for Tim. So, so what, what I get from th this wine is some really beautiful black cherry fruit. And I, I, I want to say that I even feel like I get a little sort of pine um, quality in the aroma as well. And a lot of these Western Slope vineyards are surrounded from some very tall, um, you know, it's pine trees, redwood trees, a lot of, a lot of evergreens um, all around. And so uh, even just out there in the vineyard often, like in Vogensen, um, there's some really tall trees and you get that really wonderful scent off of those trees and all the, you know, the, the things they drop on the floor, pine cones and needles and, and bits of leaves and so forth. And it's just kind of one of the part of that real beautiful character of the vineyard. Um, this does have a little bit more of a, of a tannin edge to it, but it's, it's Cabernet, so that's, that's to be expected. And I think this wine will, will age really well. Um, one of our assistant winemaker, Brian Pruitt, um, texted me a few weekends ago and said they had just been trying, he and his wife at home had been trying the 2015 uh, Western Slopes or, or Iron Slopes Cabernet and saying, oh, this is just beautiful right now. And um, I'll, I'll have a confession. I haven't been drinking a lot of wine lately because I've been on a particular diet, a keto diet, and I wasn't allowed to drink wine for a while. And so he was, he was really killing me. He was kind of digging that knife in there a little bit. But um, but it, it's really great to know that, that this wine is, is showing well in the bottle with, with a little bit of age to it. Any, any questions out there for, about this wine? No, we have a quiet group today. No questions on this one so far. They must all just be drinking it and enjoying it. I'm telling you everything you ever wanted to know and more. Um, so, you know, just, well, well, I have a minute. Maybe talk. I'll just I'll talk just briefly again about sort of the the terroir of Dry Creek Valley. Um, one of the things that makes this such a special place is having you know its its proximity in northern Sonoma County. So we're about 11 miles from the ocean, and um, we open up at the the southern end of the valley. I'll bring out this this topo map again briefly. 
So down here, the, the valley kind of opens up a little bit to um, sort of a broader plain. It becomes Russian River Valley. And that's kind of a, a floodplain when you get south of, of Healdsburg in the Russian River Valley. Um, but what that also does is sort of open up down to the greater San Francisco Bay Area region. And we get this really wonderful um, nighttime a rush of cool air that comes in from the south and makes its way up to the north um, of the valley. And, and then in the, in the morning, as the sun comes up and it slowly burns off the clouds and the fog, it goes in the opposite direction, kind of a, the cloud cover recedes going south. And so the southern end of the valley is cooler than the northern end because it tends to have um, more hours of cloud cover or, or fog than the northern end. And so at, at its most extreme, you might see as much as a 10 degree temperature difference on, on a, any given day um, between the north end where it's hot and the, the southern end where it's cooler. But we, you know, because we have sort of this gradient, we have different areas within the valley that can really give us different personalities in the fruit. And so that's, that's one of the things that makes this really special. And having just that right balance of warm days and cool nights uh, really makes it great for, for all the varieties that we're growing here. So Sauvignon Blanc, Zinfandel, and, and the Bordeaux style red, um, they all really thrive here and that's why we do those well. So we did have one question um, right before we move on to the Petit Verdot about blending. So do you change the percentage of varieties in each of your blends or do you keep to a strict recipe from year to year? And how do you approach that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't really follow a recipe, but any given blend I'm approaching, whether it might be the Mariner, which is you know our, our really great um, Meritage blend that we produce each year, or these site, you know, sort of sub-region site-specific terroir blends. Um, I, I taste through all the different lots, you know, as the wines are aging, I make notes, um, I'll give them grades, and um, you know, beyond the grades, you know, put some descriptive copy of, of flavors and aromas that I'm getting and, and color and texture, all those things. And then when it comes time to make these wines, I go back to those notes and I look at, okay, which are the lots that really stood out? Um, and, or, you know, maybe I've got five different Cabernets that, you know, could all go into one particular blend, but I wanna look for a specific um, flavor or style or texture out of, out of those different lots for the blend that I'm making. So I do have typically for a Mariner sort of a, a, a an image in my mind of what the wine should, should look, taste like, smell like. Um, and same thing with these, these, these terroir blends like the uh, Iron Slopes or the Benchland, Meritage. So I really, I really have sort of a vision of that, but that vision is in fact shaped by the vineyards that contribute to those wines. So I know the personalities of those vineyards. And so I really just identify, here's all the different lots that I have that I could use in this wine. What are the ones that I think stand out and will make it be the best? And then I start playing with those and we do some trial blends. So it is different every year. Um, that said, there are some practical realities you have to uh, uh, use to, that will affect um, what, what, you know, the percentage of, the, of what you put of each variety in the blend. Like I don't have um, oodles and oodles of Cabernet Franc. So I can't probably do a blend that's, you know, predominantly Cabernet Franc if it's of any size, you know, if it was very small, yeah, I could probably get away with it. But so I, so that's, that's a factor. Um, so it, it's just, you, that's, the, that's part of the art of blending is you have to, you know, deal with practical realities, right? I'm, I'm trying to make a certain number of cases and this is the wine I have to do it. So what can I do to get there? But um, also just, like I said, you pick the best ones and then you start to put them together. Um, I mean, I, I, in terms of a recipe or formula, I guess the amount of new oak might be the one thing that I sort of have um, somewhat of a formula, but it's that, again, we will tweak and adjust. Um, for example, um, this morning, uh, we were tasting some Zinfandel blends. This was Brian and Laura and myself, and this was happened to be the 2018 farmhouse. And I was a little concerned that the oak might stand out too much in this blend, so, from having tasted the components. So I, I made some trial blends with a fairly restrained amount of new oak. It was like around 24 and a half to 25 and a half percent new oak. And actually after we tasted these, we said, you know what? We can barely taste the oak in these wines. So there is room to use a little more. So that's, that's 
how you, you tweak, you, have, you sort of start with the goal in mind, but then you taste and let what the wines are showing you guide you and what you're gonna do in, in subsequent iterations. And we might go through several rounds of different trial blends for any given wine. You know, if, if we're really lucky, you know, it might be a, a couple of sessions where we taste different trial blends and settle on one. Um, but sometimes there's a lot of tweaking that goes on and we just, we have to do a lot of work to get the right balance. And there can be five, six different sessions where we're trying multiple different uh, blends of, of any given wine. And finally, all come to a consensus and, and settle on something that is really wonderful. Well, and kind of going back to basics, um, we got a question about noticing, Jeffrey Berman noticed that the 2017 Meritage has a very similar blend ratio to the 2017 Merlot. So why is one considered a Meritage versus the other a Merlot? And I know we have to move on, but maybe you could address that one quickly. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. And the, the, so the definition that has been decided upon by the, the Meritage Alliance um, is that you, you can't use, you have to use at least two of the traditional Bordeaux grape varieties, and you can't use more than 90% of a given, of, of a one particular variety in any, any given blend. So 90% is your, your upper threshold. Typically on our Meritage blends, we're well below that on any of, of uh, the different blends. Uh, the, the, as far as the Merlot being about the same ratio as the, um, the Meritage, uh, it wasn't by design at all. We just, I, you know, for each wine, we approached them separately and took these different lots of wine. And I don't remember offhand exactly what vineyards contributed to the Meritage, for example, versus this Merlot. I know some of them were the same because we did, you know, our, our two main Merlot vineyards are Long and Sapphire Canyon. That said, um, we, we usually have different lots within those vineyards, so not all the same lots go into any particular wine. And uh, yeah, I think it was, I could just say it was coincidence that um, the ratios are pretty similar and um, probably influenced by the vintage um, that kind of brought us to a similar um, place. So that, that being said, also the, the Meritage blend that we make, not the Mariner, but the, the one we simply call Meritage, uh, I do typically want to use more Merlot and Cab Franc in that blend because I want it to be different from the Mariner. The Mariner Cabernet Sauvignon is taking the lead. It's a, it's a bigger, darker wine. Um, our Meritage blend is, has a little more elegance and finesse and it, it's a, a lighter style Bordeaux. It's not, it's not lacking in flavor or richness or anything, but it's just a different style that you know, gives you a different texture, different mouthfeel. And uh, by, by using more Merlot and Cabernet Franc, we're giving the wine a distinctly different personality. I don't want them to be the same. Yeah, well, let's then move on to the Petit Verdot, because so make sure we give that one a little bit of time as well. Yeah, so our last wine here is the 2017 DCV9 Estate Petit Verdot. So DCV9 is our designation for this vineyard, which you also will hear us refer to as Endeavor Vineyard. Um, it's a, it's a, a large, beautiful vineyard that contributes to this wine. And um, yeah, it, it's, this is a vineyard with, that when I first came to the winery um, over nine years ago, so Don Wallace was taking me around and showing me some of the different vineyards, the estate vineyards. And we drove into this vineyard and my first thought was, you know, I looked on these beautiful sort of rolling hills um, and very even, uh, grape leaf coverage, foliage, you know, covering the, 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 these hills. And that in itself was a good sign to me. I just looked at this and said, oh, this looks like it's gonna be really good. Because if you can get, you know, when you have um, hills and little gullies or valleys within a vineyard, typically you'll get, you know, more vigorous growth down in those lower lying areas. And this is, this is, a, this is actually pretty close to what I saw when I drove in there that day. This is kind of the view almost from the entrance of the vineyard. But um, you know that those lower lying spots tend to have more vigorous vines because over years, the soil is kind of washed down um, into those lying, low lying areas. And then up on top, you tend to have rockier, less fertile soil and less growth. So um, it's, it's not unusual to just look and see sort of some more, you know, less growth and less even growth across a vineyard like this with, with different um, elevations. 
uh, but this looked very even. And so I knew that somebody had put some work in, and I didn't know what they'd done until later, but um, put some work in to really make this um, an even vineyard more uniform. And if it can be more uniform across the whole vineyard, um, then you, it takes a lot of, so maybe some of the guesswork out of it. That, that said, I have discovered that there are area, definitely areas there that are more vigorous and less vigorous, and we do sort of carve out subsections of vineyard to be harvested at different points. But we've, we've done a lot of work to, to try to make it as even as possible, and that's, that's a really good thing. Um, so at, at this vineyard, uh, we certainly grow Cabernet Sauvignon, um, that Endeavor Cabernet. Um, you know, the Cabernet there contributes to the Endeavor bottling and our, our, um, our just our Cabernet Sauvignon bottling, one we, that we call the, the, the Hillside and Benchland Cabernet, right? And uh, then we also have Petit Verdot. So that's what we have here in, the, in this glass. Give it a try. For me, I get some really beautiful cassis and dark chocolate, and maybe even sort of like a little bit of a, like a, a ginger cookie quality to it as well. Some of that, the spices, um, and, and, and you know, maybe a touch of molasses in there as well. And um, this is, this wine is the exception that proves the rule, I guess we'll say. Um, when we talk about Bordeaux blending, this one actually happens to be 100% Petit Bordeaux. There is no blending in this. And um, this is a very small bottling. And we typically do every year play around with a little bit of the Cabernet from that vineyard to see if we want to include that in the blend. But we typically like the expression of the wine as pure Petit Verdot. And, you know, it, it's, it may not be everyone's um, preference, but I really love this as a big, dark, rich Bordeaux style red. Petit Verdot is, is probably the most darkly colored of the five main Bordeaux grape varieties. Cabernet Sauvignon is close often, but Petit Verdot, if, if done right and done well, typically is just beautiful dark color. It, it also tends to not have, in my opinion, as much of the herbaceous or green qualities that can come with Cabernet. You know, Cabernet will get some beautiful fruit and some maybe some sort of dried herbs along with that. Don't tend, tend to typically get the dried herb quality in the Petit Verdot, but a lot of beautiful fruit, like I said, very chocolatey kind of, of, of richness to the wine as well. And um, just really big and rich, but we've, we've been able to sort of tame the tannins um, through good management of the fermenting, for, for the fermenters when we press it off. And so it's not overly tannic, it's not um, drying out your mouth. And I think, you know, this on a, you know, you're, you're gonna have a, you know, big, big nice steak, and this wine would be really great. And, um, you know, or, or just, you know, a night by the fire, if it's a cold night and you wanna cozy up with someone special and have something that's kind of like just a meal in itself. This wine, this wine's a ticket, I think. And, uh, you know, as far as, as Petit Verdot goes in the vineyard, it's, it's, it's really interesting to me. I, I, I love, um, you know, the ampelography, which is, which is identifying what a variety uh, a particular grapevine is. And, um, the, you know, now we have DNA testing, so it, it's taken all of the sort of the art out of, out of the identification of, of of grape varieties, but it's still a useful skill to have because you don't, you know, it's not like I carry my lab in my back pocket. If I'm out in the vineyard, I can just, you know, whip that out and check the DNA of that vine right there. So, um, but it, it's really fun to me to, because you look at the leaves, um, you know, like this is a Malbec leaf I pulled from BCV6 just before we started. And the shape of the leaf um, and how, how these, all these little indentations and these little um, indentations here occur. That helps you identify the variety. The color of the leaf, the hairiness on the back or lack thereof, and then of course you know how the, the coloring of the shoots and how the how the vine grows and of course the fruit itself. And, and Petit Verdot tends to, you know, Cabernet has these sort of looser clusters and Petit Verdot tends to have a little more compact clusters. Um, the other thing that you can use to sort of identify it. It's typically the leaves will often, when it's um, close to ripening the fruit, the leaves will have a somewhat yellow green color to them. You know, Cabernet tends to be very 
dark green color, but Pete Verdot can get this, this little more yellowish tinge to it. And the one characteristic of Petit Verdot is it tends to want to set a, a fairly large crop. So typically with Cabernet, um, even with Merlot, uh, we'll get maybe two clusters per shoot. Um, and Petit Verdot, you often will get three clusters on the shoots. So that's one of the things I always, you know, every year when we're, we're getting ready to do cluster thinning, um, fruit thinning, sort of, the, sort of the green thinning pass, that first pass through the vineyard, I'm always reminding the guys in the vineyard, okay, Petit Verdot, look for the third cluster. Let's, let's not let it try to set too uh, much crop because the site where this is at the Endeavor Vineyard is not particularly vigorous. So we want to have a balanced crop. We don't want the vines trying to ripen too much fruit. And that's just happened to be a characteristic of Petit Verdot. It tends to have more cluster per shoot. So we're always going in there and looking for that and typically cutting off you know, that third cluster and getting the vines more in balance. Um, Great. Well, it looks like we have one kind of last question here, which is kind of a bonus question because it's not necessarily about these wines, but Linda Moore was asking, how do you choose what goes into the VIP wine? If you can answer that as kind of our last wrap-up question. Yeah, um, so another good question. And, and that is, as you know, is a very limited bottling. Uh, it basically represents about five barrels worth of wine. And so we want this to be a very sort of creme de la creme kind of blend of the best of the best. And that's how we approach it. So, you know, I have this whole slate of different Bordeaux style blends I'm trying to make, right? I'm trying to do the Mariner, I'm trying to do the Endeavor, I'm trying to do the VIP, I've got the Terroir blends. And uh, the VIP will look for, and again, typically the Cabernet takes the lead in this blend, but we'll look for the best lots. And with this one, because it's so, so small, we can get very specific on barrels. So um, it's not just you know the best lot, but the best barrels within a lot. Like, let's say I have some Cabernet from the Walcott Vineyard that we were talking about earlier, or, or Endeavor. Within, you know, I'll, I'll have, I'll, I'll, we'll bring that fruit in, we'll ferment it. When we put it down the barrel, I'll typically have it go into two, three, maybe even four different types of new oak. And then some of the barrels will be barrels that were used one, once before. So it's a second fill barrel that will still contribute some oak flavor. And then some of them are older barrels that we might say are, are neutral. They're not really contributing a lot of oak flavor, but they still have give us the benefit of aging in a barrel, that, that really wonderful slow um, uptake of oxygen that occurs um, best in a barrel. And so, um, so within any given pick or a lot of wine, I've got all these different barrel treatments. And that gives me the opportunity. It's like, let's say I only have two barrels of this really wonderful French oak cooperage, you know, that's a really high end cooperage. I can pick one of those or two of those for the VIP blend, even though in a bigger blend, it's not going to have as big of an influence. It can have a really distinctive, um, different flavor profile than um, some other barrels and some other blends that we're going to make. So I guess I say all that just to say we, we really get down to the barrel level with that wine and pick um, select barrels and types of oak and varieties and vineyards that we just think really represent the best of, of that particular vintage. Great. That's yes, perfect. and then we did have one last bonus. So I know everybody wants to, to probably get on with their dinner or their, their cocktails for the night, but um, we do have one last question that I wanted to address because I've been chatting with Martin um, during this and he was curious if when we have a hotter vintage, are you trying to emphasize certain varietals over others to try to keep that balance of acidity and tannins? And does that make sense? It does, yeah, absolutely. And I, it, it could work out that way. Um, yeah, you just, I, like with these, with these blends where there's not really a, a formula, I respond to what turned out best in that, that year. Um, so, you know, the, the 2017 vintage, because of some of that hotter weather, we did get some pretty concentrated wines. And so that could be an opportunity to maybe use a little bit more of something like Merlot or Malbec, um, but, it, but it didn't tend to tan translate to a lot of tannin. Like, like uh, 2013 vintage, for example, could also produce very concentrated reds, but there were some big tannins in the Cabernet um, in particular. And that was why with the 2013 Mariner, 
we used more Malbec that year because Malbec tends to have a little more softer tannin. Plus that, what I was talking about earlier about that Malbec rounds out that mid palate, kind of makes it plumper. Um, it really was the key to the 2013 Mariner blend. Whereas, um, you know, 2017, even though the wines are very dense and concentrated and really wonderful in that way, um, the tannins didn't um, come along with that so much. So um, didn't have to respond with, you know, mixing up, you know, using some of the lighter or less tannic grape varieties, maybe quite as much in some of these Meritage blends. And um, yeah, I mean, as far as anything else, like, like acidity, you know, we kind of just take each, each lot as it comes. Some vineyards will naturally have higher acids and some will have less. And so again, by blending, we can kind of achieve a nice balance there as well. Great. Well, thanks so much for answering that. And thank you to everyone for joining us. We're going to go ahead and wrap up here and let you guys get on with the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for your continued support of our family winery. And thank you so much for jumping on here and spending an hour of your life with us. We, we miss you all so much. And we just love these opportunities to get to interact with you and give you a little bit of the art tasting room in your house. Say, Kim, Tim, do you have any final words for everybody? Uh, just uh, keep hanging in there and uh, enjoy some good wine and you're, as you're sheltering. Stay safe and um, cheers to you all. I do really look forward, as, as Sarah said, to seeing you here at our different events and having a chance to drink a glass of wine, share it together. It's, it's the good thing in life, so let's keep enjoying it. Absolutely. Cheers to that. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your night.